Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Brewer, and I have the great honor and privilege to serve as the president of Mitchell Community College. Tonight, we're providing this panel and conversation on two very important topics. One topic is basic law enforcement training and how we do that at Mitchell Community College. The other topic is how our local law enforcement agencies uh, receive resources to do the job that they do. I thank you all for your time and participating in this very important and relevant and these very important and relevant topics. At this time, I'd like to pass it on to Dr. Beverly Brown, who is uh, the director of our inclusion and equity project here at Mitchell Community College. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brewer, and thank you all for joining us tonight for this very important conversation. It's so great to see so many faces here, and it looks like more people are continuing to join us. So again, welcome and thank you for, for joining us. I would like to take a moment here to begin with um, to ask our panelists to go around and um, introduce themselves to our guest. Um, if you could please tell us your name, and your position, and maybe a little bit about yourself, whatever you want to share with yourself about Iredell County or, or Mitchell or anything else that seems applicable to you before we begin the discussion. Who would like to, to start us off? I'll be glad to. Uh, my name's uh, Todd Carver. I'm the basic law enforcement training uh, coordinator for Mitchell Community College. Uh, a lot of people call that BLET, uh, and that's the state mandated course uh, that you have to take to become a law enforcement officer in the state of North Carolina. Uh, I just retired from the sheriff's office. I completed my 30 year career in law enforcement in uh, January and then started working for the college here in uh, March of this year. Um, graduate from Mitchell Community College, uh, raised a family here in Iredell County, um, live here, lots of skin in the game uh, and, and Really excited tonight to talk about uh, the, the reality of how we do BLET and basic law enforcement training in North Carolina to, to uh, dispel some myths. I think there are a lot of myths out there for the community and I think this is a good opportunity for us to have a discussion about some of those uh, misconceptions. Thank you, Mr. Carver. Who would like to go next? Hi guys. Uh, Matt Burleson here with the Sheriff's Office. Uh, Sheriff really wanted to be here, but tonight is his daughter's sweet 16. So uh, he was otherwise engaged on a nice date tonight. Uh, so, uh, Lieutenant, I get to work with the school resource officers, uh, which is a very large expanding group. Uh, we get to deal with a lot of young folks and uh, in, in and out around the school system. Uh, also working crime prevention and education and information throughout the county. Uh, so really privileged to have this opportunity. Uh, personally, just like uh, Todd had said, I got some skin in the game here. This is my community. I've got a son that's going through a senior this year in Mooresville High School. Uh, also the uh, Mitchell College uh, teaching in that BLET program that Todd's talking about for quite a few years now and uh, coming on with the curriculum this year uh, with Mitchell College. So excited about that as well. So uh, thank you, Dr. Brewer and um, uh, Ms. Brown and, and all those who have put this opportunity on uh, to come and engage the community, uh, have this uh, uh, sometimes difficult, but definitely enlightening discussion with us. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Addison. I'm with the Statesville Police Department. I'm the chief of police here. I got hired in Statesville in February of 2019. Prior to coming to Statesville, I worked for the city of Durham, where I left as a captain over the Special Services Division. A um, little bit about me. I'm an associate in engineering and bachelor's in IT and a juris doctor in law. I'm actually a licensed attorney in the state of North Carolina, and I like to volunteer my time with legal aid and helping people with non-criminal issues. Uh, so that's a little bit about me and glad to be on the panel. Thank you. So I guess I'm the last one. Uh, I'm Ron Campricciani. I'm the police chief in Mooresville. And uh, I've been here now for a little over a year. I've been in law enforcement for 35 years, uh, all of those in Massachusetts. I came down here last June uh, when the Mooresville Police Department was in a little bit of a turmoil. 
uh, and it was not my intent to stay in this area. It was a six month um, position to try to do what I could to turn the police department around, restructure it. Um, but uh, I fell in love with this place down here. North Carolina is really a unique spot and Mooresville and Iredell County in particular. Um, and so I think I bring a little different perspective in that I've come from the outside and maybe come with a different set of lenses. But as I've said, um, it's a pretty impressive place down here. Uh, and especially with law enforcement and the way it works in North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I will ask, and it looks like everybody's already doing this, that when you're not speaking um, on the panel, if you can uh, keep your microphone muted and that will help with any possible feedback. So we appreciate that. Um, now, going back out to our speaking to our guests here, um, give you giving you a little bit of context. So as uh, as we received questions kind of in conversation and dialogue through the late spring through the summer. Um, these ideas were gathered and the decision was uh, was made after our panelists so kindly agreed to come and spend this time with us tonight to uh, discuss some of the questions that uh, the community had had brought to us and uh, have a dialogue, have a conversation. Uh, and some of you may remember we did this at Mitchell maybe around 2014 and had a, a really great conversation about law enforcement at Iredell County. And I think it was very informative um, and a great event in Shearer Hall that night. Different location here. We appreciate you all being with us here in this digital format, which is a, a, a new for all of us. Uh, but we will continue to move through this and, and I'm sure this is going to be a great conversation. So I would like to jump into our first set of questions, which specifically relate to our BLET training. This is our basic law enforcement training that Mr. Carver has already spoken to. And we're going to start off by some questions um, about the curriculum for the BLET and um, some specific questions about what is taught, what is not taught, those types of things. So I'm going to start off with Mr. Carver and I would like to ask him if you could just provide a little bit about what the curriculum is that is uh, set by the state. Maybe a little explanation about what your curriculum is for BLET. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, so I think it's important for the community to understand that uh, the the training that's put forward in BLET is a state mandated course uh, set of a prescripted curriculum. So there are 36 different blocks of training in BLET that we're required to cover. We're required to give so many hours of instruction, a minimum number of hours for each of those blocks. And they vary greatly. Uh, you know, say for instance, uh, driver's training you know, 40 hours of instruction. And there's some other blocks of instruction, uh, maybe court duties, that, that's a four hour block of instruction. But like I said, there are 36 different blocks and they cover a lot of different topics, a lot of different material. Um, everything from, like I say, uh, doing reports, accident investigations, um, different uh, responsibilities, say for uh, civil process service. Uh, and then one of them, the one that is of particular interest for this discussion, is a block we call SCAT, and that's Subject Control and Arrest Techniques. And uh, that, that particular block of instruction, uh, is, there's a lot of hands-on um, moving parts to that block of instruction. Uh, and um, so I, I hope that that answers. The students have to there's a minimum of 640 hours in BLET, so it's basically one semester if you're going Monday through Friday from eight in the morning to six at night um, is the, the requirement to become a police officer in the state of North Carolina is that you go through BLET. So everybody out there, uh, everybody that Chief Capricciani, uh, Chief Addison, and the sheriff has working for them, you know, is required to go through BLET to get this state mandated course. At the end, there's a written examination, a test that everybody has to pass. Uh, they pass that test and then they're, they're good to go on for employment. Thank you so much. 
Uh, moving on to the next question here. Is placing the knee on a subject's neck a method taught in the BLET program and training? And if it is not, what are the students taught about this method? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very clear, very resounding. And let me, let me preface what I'm gonna talk to you about with SCAT in, by saying that I am not a SCAT instructor. Uh, but I have talked with our SCAD instructors at length about this list of questions so that I can get some accurate answers. Um, no, our students are not taught to put a knee onto the neck of a suspect as a method of controlling that subject. When I was talking to the SCAT instructor about that question, they, they said for me to be careful with that though. There is a technique that's taught where the, if you've got a suspect under arrest, and you, they're, um, you're, you get them handcuffed behind their back, where that we do teach the officers to put a knee onto the, the center of the back to try and hold that person down. Um, and so just depending on the angle that a person was standing at, they might, if they just a really quick glance or maybe the, the angle of the camera or something like that, it might look like they were doing that, but that is not at all. We, we don't teach students to put a knee onto the neck of uh, any person that they're attempting to get control of. Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Uh, what are the students taught about shooting a suspect in the back? Yeah, and uh, I'll, the rest of the panelists are more than welcome to jump in on, on any of this stuff. Uh, we wanted to just start it off with a couple of those that were directly curriculum related. Um, and so I'll give a real quick answer on that uh, with the uh, shooting the suspect in the back. Uh, I think there's a proper time and a place for everything. Uh, and unfortunately, and I know that a lot of people really have not, I, I guess, thought this one, this, this scenario through but sometimes you can use deadly force to protect yourself or another person. So Dr. Brown, let's just imagine that, that someone has you on the ground and is literally choking the life out of you. And I approach you and this person from the back. The, their back is to me as I approach them. Maybe the only place I can use force against that person is, is in their back, is at their back. So I think that's one of those things that we're taught, you know, uh, early on in life is that, hey, it's not fair to shoot somebody in the back. And, and I, ideally you wouldn't want to, but there are times when it is the most appropriate thing to do. And I think it's important to say, and it's important for the community to hear us say, that's not the situation like say was down in Charleston or that the, the, uh, the victim in that case was running away from the officer and he just shot him in the back. You know, that officer was prosecuted and is in prison for that. Uh, that's not what we're teaching officers to do, but sometimes we do teach officers that you have to use deadly force to protect a third party. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes that involves shooting people in the back. I'll let some of the rest of the panelists there uh, weigh in on that. I'm sure they'll want to. to. To kind of echo what you were saying, when you're looking at, and you know, preserving life, when you're looking at deadly force, deadly force is only used to stop deadly force. We don't use deadly force to preserve property. So if somebody's breaking into your car, you don't use deadly force. When you're looking on those one-on-one -on -one situations and people often say, well, you know, when that, that guy, and you come back, you see the autopsy report, and that gentleman or that individual was shot in the back. One of the things we have to also remember too is, and not, we can only use deadly force as long as deadly force is presented to us. When deadly force is no longer presented to us, we don't have that as afforded to us as an option. So we wanna make sure we clarify that in the very beginning. The second portion of that is, it's easy for us to Monday morning quarterback. And it's nice, and sometimes officers are put in very precarious situations. Um, and in the example that you gave down in South Carolina, that was clearly negligent uh, for the officer to shoot that gentleman as he was running away. But just if you can imagine in certain cases where somebody's being chased by the police and they take that gun and they fire it over their shoulder, 
behind themselves to get that officer away from them with the intentions of stopping that officer from chasing them. And that officer is not, he doesn't, he or she doesn't have the opportunity to wait for somebody to turn around so I can shoot them in the front. But those have, and those are, those are critiqued very harshly because we have to be careful when we're talking about using deadly force. It's not something that we, it's an everyday occurrence and we don't encourage, but we do want to make sure that we're protecting our community and the officers are safe as well. So there's several different instances where that can happen, but those are very rare. When you look at the overall scope of things, the use of deadly force is very rare. Last year with the State School Police Department, we received over 81,000 calls. Um, out of the 81,000 calls, 61,000 were dispatched. That means an officer was sent out to respond to a call for service. And out of 61,000 calls, we had 27 use of forces. Now 27 gun discharges, 27 use of forces. No one was shot last year, and we're very fortunate for that. But in saying that, I watched video where the officers have showed great restraint because that's the last thing you want to do is to take someone's life. That is not something high on somebody's list when they get up in the morning about what they want to do because you have to live with that for the rest of your life. Thank you. Thank you. Any other panel panelists would like to speak to that question? Well, I'll try to uh, uh, speak to that. Uh, one of the situations that the Sheriff's Office has used is the Citizens Training Academy. Uh, during this academy, we use a, a uh, it's not a game, but it's a video uh, setup, uh, a shooting simulator. And that uh, I believe the college has one as well. And uh, that, that puts the operator in a situation where it's like a shoot don't shoot and uh going through uh the history and some of the, the the times that i've utilized that uh one of the things that uh director carver had talked about the standing over a person that's down uh i, I can see that i can see that replay in in one of those scenarios um uh, and for the citizens you know come out for the citizens academy uh, uh I, I know that my wife tried it one time and uh, there was a situation where she had shot the guy in a suicide vest, but it was in a school. And so she was trying to, you know, she thought that was a way to protect uh, all those, all those citizens. So there, there's split second decisions that officers are faced with. Um, uh, just like Chief Addison said, it's easy to Monday, Monday morning quarterback to, to, to have, you know, I, hindsight's always 2020. So one of the things that, that we try to do is, is educate as much as possible um, and prepare the officers, you know, with these shooting simulators, um, uh, the, the way the BLET has. So uh, we do, the sheriff's office does run these officers back through those and, and just try to, you know, it's, it's not a desensitization, but it's almost like an inoculation, a stress inoculation uh, where, um, where we try to make sure that we're able to protect the public uh, like Chief Addison said, this is not property. This is uh, uh, imminent threat of serious bodily injury or death to the officer or a third person. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't really have much to add. Everybody sort of said everything that can be said on this subject. I, I just think, and, and I know we're probably going to get into more of this later on in this discussion, which I hope we do. But I think people need to understand that um, Chief Addison alluded to it. No police officer that I know of, and like I said, I've been doing this for 35 years, gets up in the morning hoping they're going to go to work that night and have to shoot somebody. In fact, it's just the opposite. Um, we go to work, these men and women, they go to work every day hoping that they get to go home that night. Um, and we're all sons and husbands and daughters and wives and and we all have families and uh like i said sometimes um things are, we get portrayed in a bad light because of the situations we're forced into um but like i said we 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 don't wake up in the morning hoping to something like that is going to happen but i can tell you everybody wakes up hoping they get home and i can tell you as a chief I think I can speak for the other ones on this panel the same way. It's the thing that keeps us up at night, making sure our officers go home at night um, and that we don't, because nothing's worse, and I've had to do it, nothing's worse than going to a home and telling a 
a wife or a husband or and children that uh, their mom and dad isn't coming home anymore. So um, I think if we if we look at it through that set of lenses, um, I think you'll have a different perspective on what we do every day. Thank you. Dr. Brown, and I would like to extend the invitation because we do have a, a firearm simulator at the college. Uh, I would extend the invitation to, you know, folks who, who would be interested in seeing what it's like, as Matt said, to make that split second decision. Um, bring them by. We've, we've had journalists before do that type of stuff. I know when I was at the sheriff's office, we had a reporter come by and, and it completely changed the person's perspective uh, once you're, you're looking at it in real time. And uh, I would extend that invitation. We, we can make that happen for anybody who would like to come and experience that. Thank you, Mr. Carver. And thank you everyone for sharing on that one. This next question, there's some overlap here. So it, if you have something new to share, we'll jump in there. The question is, what are students taught about when it is appropriate to draw their gun or their taser? Who would like to start that one? Uh, okay, guys, I'd just like to say some of the opportunities I've had to uh, uh, teach the use of force continuum uh, to my uh, high school and, and college uh, students and citizens as well in the academy is um, uh, there's, there's stair steps. You go up these stair steps, obviously uh, the uniform, the officer presence, the, uh, uh, the verbal uh, commands that are given, uh, then you enter into uh, placing hands on someone. Now this is when they've been seized, when they're under arrest, uh, a Fourth Amendment seizure uh, for for a crime that uh, is probably committed or or I believe to have been committed. Um, at that point in time, you have to determine is there uh, some type of force being used against us uh, or someone else, like Chief Addison has said. Uh, obviously, a gun is deadly force using uh, any type of firearm consists of deadly force. So someone else is about to die. It's me, it's someone else. There's a gun being used. There's deadly force uh, at hand or what I reasonably believe to be deadly force. A taser is considered less lethal, uh, kind of falls in line, uh, some of those stair steps with an impact weapon, uh, an ASP uh, brand baton or some type of impact weapon, uh, along with OC spray, which is the uh, commonly known as pepper spray. Um, now, I'm not going to get into the order of where those are because every agency has a different policy on where those fall into place, but I will tell you that a taser is considered a less lethal uh, use of force. Uh, so maybe a non-compliant individual, maybe someone who is balling up their fist, uh, gritting their teeth, red face, and about to charge me. Uh, they may not um, uh, constitute a deadly force, but definitely force is about to be used against me. So do I want to uh, tussle and wrestle and, and you know, with this person, or do I want to utilize a less lethal means of force, such as a taser or a pepper spray to end this uh, quickly and reasonably so that uh, less persons are injured in the situation. So that's what I'll say to uh, taser versus gun. And to just kind of expound a little bit further, what LT said is, is right on point, but that is only deployed until the point that is not needed. So in effect, we're doing a vehicle stop because we possibly got a tag. This vehicle was stolen and it was probably taken during the midst of a robbery. And we get there and we find out that the information that was given to us was incorrect. Doing a felony vehicle stop, we may have guns drawn, but as soon as we realize that that is not the case and that we're in a different situation, that use of force drops or stops. Thank you. Another thing I'd like to add on that too is that uh, first uh, there's, Tasers are not taught, they're not part of the BLET curriculum. Uh, that's something that the, co the college does facilitate that training, but not through the BLET program. Um, for our, our agencies, um, I think all the agencies in Iredale County are, are carrying them in some form or fashion, but not every officer uh, is required to carry a taser, so it's not part of the BLET training. Uh, but, and I will say that there are, there are times when an officer is just doing you know, there's an unknown risk. You know, uh, maybe you're 
you're searching a, a building um, that's been broken into or you're you're looking for a suspect when an officer may draw their weapon and have it in a position we call low ready where that you're you're you not got it pointed at anybody there's nobody to point the gun at but that you're ready because what you're doing is just a risky um situation you know out here searching a, a building uh in the night um is is a dangerous thing and, and a lot of the things that officers do are dangerous tasks and i would never want to take that ability for an officer who felt hey i may need to use this weapon to protect myself here in a few minutes i may not and like the chief said hey when everything's okay i put the weapon up no harm no foul but uh i don't want to say that that the only time that uh cadets are taught to draw their weapon is when there's you know imminent uh threat of deadly force right then and there that you can see uh, because there's certainly some situations that you can't see it yet. You don't know what you don't know what you're walking into. And every one of the four of us on this panel, I can assure you, have drawn our weapon in a situation like that. So I think just to expand on that a little bit is, you know, we're a very regulated industry, if you want to call it that, for people are always looking see what we do, how we do things, if things can be done better. Use of a gun, I think everybody's hit on that. It sort of speaks for itself. I think it's important a little bit for everybody to understand where tasers came from and why they came into existence. And, uh, you know, the DOJ, the Department of Justice, released a 300-page report a number of years ago on the use of tasers. But tasers were brought into policing because we had no other really means of uh, we had pretty much, we had the gun. Back then we had mace, which didn't work on a lot of people, and we had nightsticks. And so when you had somebody that wasn't compliant, didn't want to go, wanted to, wanted to fight you, or uh, as you're trying to get them into custody, we didn't have a lot of tools at our disposal. And unfortunately, the things that we did have either caused injuries to the suspects and the officers, or both. And as a result of that, um, they started to look at tasers and tasers was a way to, you know, there, there have been a few cases where people have had some reactions to tasers, but for the most part, people aren't killed using tasers and they're incapacitated for a few seconds, enough for us to cuff them, get them under control and get them in the car. And it has, and it has greatly diminished injuries to both suspects and officers. So. Um, I think it's important as we talk about that now to understand where tasers came from in the first place. Thank you everyone for those comments. Um, let's see the, the last one in that set of questions. Do officers from each of the departments or divisions on the panel have to wear body cams? And if so, is it mandatory for the cams to be turned on at the initiation of a vehicle stop or a house call, et cetera? Anyone like to start with that one? I can start. Um, Chief Addison with the Statesville Police Department. Our officers are issued body cams and they're turned on just about on every call they go on. So unless you stop and say, hey, I just want to talk to you about an issue for the most part, but if there's any possibility that we think that something may come out of this, that body cam is turned on. Our body cam actually records a minute before. So when you turn the body cam on, it's already recording, but it goes back one minute and starts the video from there moving forward. So if it, an officer is in an unfortunate situation where something flares in an instant, when you turn that body cam on, it goes back a minute before then. So we get to see that video before then. So not just the instant they turn it on but it's mandatory for them to turn them on. It's in our policy. So just to hop in on this, um, town of Mooresville, we just spent a, a lot of money to update our body cameras and in, in-car in dash cameras. Uh, when I first arrived here, they weren't really working that well. So we have in-car cameras and we have body cameras and they both go on as soon as the blue lights are activated in the cruiser, they both turn on automatically. If one officer was to be out in a scene, anytime they have any type of personal contact with the public, uh, they have to turn their body cameras on regardless of what their contact is. 
if one officer is supposed to stay be on a stop or is out talking with somebody uh, and they have their body camera turned on and another officer um, walks up with them while they're there, if they don't turn their body camera on, our system will automatically turn that body camera on for them. Additionally, we can do a live look-in. Uh, my, myself and my command staff have the ability of, we have automatic vehicle locators on our, in our dispatch center, so we know where every car is where. Uh, and so we can look in live feed on the officer's body cam at the time to see what's going on in a particular stop. So, um, and, and so we, we felt that was the best way to go uh, to be as transparent as we can. Um, body cameras, I think, and in-car cameras are invaluable. Um, and I can tell you that the town of Mooresville invested $1.3 million in this technology because we think it's just that important. So, um, and it also takes a lot of the um, officers don't have to worry about whether they turned it on or didn't turn on in a lot of cases. Uh, so we've tried to make it, like I said, we try to be transparent as possible. Uh, and the system we have now is, is really, really a top-notch system. So guys, the uh, Sheriff's Office uh, does not utilize the body-worn cameras. We do have the uh, eyewitness cameras and uh, uh, as well as the custom signals incorporated uh, high-definition cameras in our vehicles, in our patrol cars. And just like Chief Camperchani said, the blue lights come on, uh, they, they activate. Uh, speeding or going uh, faster than, uh, than uh, I think it's 80 miles an hour, I believe the, uh, it, it comes on. So, um, and, and these are utilized in a lot of uh, motor vehicle accidents and situations involving uh, um, officers and incidents, just like uh, Chief Addison said, it records before and uh, also after, and it automatically comes on in a collision. So that's great. Uh, we do have 200 and I think it's 89 employees at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, so with that many people, just the cost uh, alone uh, to, to outfit all these guys with the body worn cameras, uh, just, just the unit that I work with, uh, uh, our school resource officers, uh, there's, there's 19 of us. And so, um, you know, there's, there may be some constitutional or privacy issues that, that could arise within the school system. Uh, there's the, the, the FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act, um, you know, that, that, that we utilize now. We have some issues with that with the school officers as well as the, the cameras that are recording at the school system basis. So uh, just some areas that the Sheriff's Office has not delved into yet. Just like uh, Chief Camper Johnny said, there's so much uh, cost uh, to it, we've just not uh, not gone down that road yet. So we do utilize those car cameras. Dr. Brown, one thing I'd just like to say on that about uh, cameras is, you know, when I started in, in law enforcement, and I'm sure when Chief Campuchani started, there were no uh, cameras, even in-car cameras. Uh, I remember getting my first in-car camera and how excited I was to be able to rewind it back and watch a traffic stop I had just done. And, and the first couple of times I did that, uh, I did a little soul searching with myself and I was like, I didn't realize I sounded quite like, I didn't mean to sound that way when I was talking to that person. And I was able to use it to moderate my own behavior just from a personal uh, standpoint. I, I was able to do that because I didn't realize it. And I will just say from my experience, I've seen cameras whether it be body worn cameras or in car cameras, get more officers out of trouble than I have ever seen get officers in trouble. Uh, whether it be car accidents where somebody said, no, no, I had a green light and the in car camera clearly showed the officer had a green light. Um, I, I don't know officers who are afraid of body cameras. That, that to me is, is you know, there are places where you can't practically uh, afford body cameras for everybody, but I don't know officers, uh, we've been getting recorded for, for 15, 20 years. So I don't, I don't hear anybody in the, in, in the law enforcement communities uh, fearing cameras. Thank you. I think we covered all of those. 
So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about mental health just a little bit. And one of the questions is about mental health screening for potential officers. And another question is about um, mental health and psychological disorders that the officers may come into contact with out in the community. So the first question is what mental health screenings are in place for potential officers? So I can tell you that for us, uh, when somebody in our department and we give them a, I give them a conditional offer of employment and that is subject to a few things, um, drug and alcohol testing, um, a polygraph, and also uh, they have to go for a psychological exam. Uh, FMRT does that for us uh, and it's a pretty extensive examination that they do and then they will give us a report back. And if it turns out um, that that person is not suitable based on their psychological makeup, um, then we rescind the offer of employment. Most people are not hired. One of the things that we also do to echo with the more chief has said is we also look at, at a psychiatric evaluation prior to being hired with the state school police department we check, we do a very thorough background. We talk to friends, family, people that are close to the applicant to determine if there's anything in their past that would possibly throw up any type of flag for us to be concerned about. Um, once you're hired with the State School Police Department, all of our officers going through are going through crisis intervention training, which is CIT. It's, that allows officers to deal with people who are having um, some type of, who are, who I don't want to say mentally disadvantaged because they're, they're just having, they're suffering mentally. So but able, being able to deal with that person where they are, because when people without 911, they're not calling us because they're having a great day. People are calling us because they are in need of help. Um, sometimes that help may be in the form of, I think I'm gonna commit suicide, but that training has been so essential because it teaches the officers to meet people where they are, and how to deal with people that normally doesn't operate within the groups that we would normally see. Um, that has been able to give officers a lot more patience and understanding while we're still enforcing law. So I think once you get on, I think that class CIT is phenomenal. I think it's an awesome course. And we'll make sure all of our new recruits go through it as well, but it is incredible. But prior to getting hired, we do have a psychiatric and after being hired, we go through our CIT program. So I wanna echo that uh, uh, about the CIT. Uh, I went through that class uh, probably about seven, eight, maybe 10 years ago. Great training on de-escalation about uh, avoiding conflict, uh, maybe not avoiding conflict, but, but managing the conflict that sometimes officers are put into. Uh, so that is a great class. And as a matter of fact, the, the college has reached out to our partners uh, to try and set that up. And as soon as we can get past COVID, we're gonna have another CIT training offered hopefully this fall um, for, our, for our agencies in the community. So uh, there's, there is no psychological assessment done Prior to BLET, those are, uh, as both the chiefs have said, and, and Matt will echo here in just a minute for the sheriff's office, those are uh, pre-employment screenings, uh, but they're not pre-BLET screenings. Uh, I wouldn't be allowed to do that as the BLET coordinator um, because the state standard doesn't say anything about that to become a, uh, to go to attend BLET, so I can't add extra restrictions on there. So that answers, I hope that answers the question for you. Yeah, guys, uh, same thing. Pre-employment screening uh, is done through an independent company. Uh, it's based on successful officers that, that have had a team before. Uh, obviously extensive background. Uh, you know, the sheriff's office is responsible for uh, uh, the concealed carry handgun permits and other permits. So uh, we're, we're really, really good at backgrounds. We'll make sure we check everything we can on, on, the, on the folks. Uh, CIT training is incredible. Uh, we utilize that, utilize that with the school resource officers. Our in-service training, I remember a few years back, um, uh, we actually did a little over and above. We taught hearing impaired. Uh, that was one of the things that uh, had come up because of uh, some of our population uh, within our detention center. Uh, so we, we taught that as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're, we're facing more and more nowadays that, that I like to see uh, is autism 
uh, more autistic training. And uh, so I got with the school official and the school resource officers went through that. Uh, and we're looking at being able to maybe expand that to some of our patrol divisions as well. But just recognizing uh, some of the sensory issues uh, that, that our autistic folks face and uh, uh, the CIT is, is the, you know, a person in crisis uh, having that mental, mental crisis. Thank you all. You actually, uh, most of you have already touched on the second question, but I'll, I'll go ahead and ask this. And if we have something else to contribute, you can please jump in. The second question was, what mental health training is offered related to psychological disorders that officers may see on duty? Anything else to be added to that? Yeah, I would, I, I would just want to say that in BLET, we have a particular block of instruction uh, dealing with uh, individuals with mental illness. It's a 24-hour block of instruction um, where that we, <coughs> excuse me, where that we uh, teach the officers about that. We also have another block of instruction uh, responding to victims where that we can talk about different um, situations that you may encounter when dealing with uh, victims, whether they may be visual impairments, hear hearing impairments, or both. Um, so there, there is training uh, that's offered to the officers in BLET to try and prepare them for that. But uh, when an officer gets out there, you really need that CIT training. That That's a good tool to put in your tool belt. So just one other thing on that question. Actually, this is, I guess, an answer of a question that actually fits between these two questions. Uh, and what we put in place here, I put a program in place a few months back where we use an early warning system for our officers. Um, we do everything that the director has said and the chief in Statesville and CIT training and everything like that. But we also have a, a system for our officers that have been on the job for a while. And we use an early warning tracking system that tracks things like if they're getting into accidents or if they're use of force, if there's use of force issues with them, or if they're calling in sick a lot, or there's a number of um, things that they do daily that go into this algorithm. Um, and it lets us know if this is an officer we should probably call in and talk to because they may be having issues. Uh, there could be sleep issues, could be issues at home. There could be a lot of things that for some reason, this officer is falling into these risk categories that this program has defined. So we use that, uh, like I said, we just started a few months ago. Um, and so as it rolls out, we're gonna use that to track officers so we can make sure that their mental health um, stays where it should be as, as they're going out there. Because, you know, for, listen, if we're all being honest here, you know, we're a sort of an A dominant personality profession. And um, it's a hard time a lot of times for the police to reach out and they don't want to seem to be weak or ask for help or things like that. So we thought that was important to put in place so that we can, it gives us as an administrators a chance to see to make sure that none of these officers are having problems like that because it's eventually going to flow over into the public uh, and that could be an incident there that's not good. So uh, we put a lot of stock in this and uh, I think it's going to be a great program for us. To kind of echo the chief in Mooresville, we actually have that program in place in Statesville. We did the heavy lefty last year and what the software which allows us to track officers use of force accidents but the one thing that we really kind of employ here is the officers checking in with one another. Because as he said, we're a type A personality. We're a group that doesn't, you know, we ask us if we're good, we're going to be good. Um, and the hard thing to do is to crack that shell. So we have to make sure that we're checking in on each other. So if an officer is going through something like we had an officer that witnessed a homicide um, or respond to a homicide scene for the first time, and that was very traumatic. We want to make sure that he was fine before we returned back to work. So those systems that we put in place, and I agree with the chief that you have to have them. You use every precaution you possibly can to make sure your people are well. Thank you. Any other comments on, on mental health? Great, thank you. you. You all had a lot to share there. So this is the, uh, the final question under training. 
how are issues related to racial profiling addressed in basic law enforcement training? So that is a pretty straightforward uh, answer for you also. Uh, in, in BLET, you're taught in a couple of different blocks, uh, whether it be elements of criminal law, arrest, search and seizure. Uh, you know, stopping a person based on their race is, it's illegal. And, uh, and it's, it's not tolerated in any of the agencies I've ever worked for. Um, and it's certainly not taught to our officers that, that that's a, a conduct that's gonna be tolerated in any of the agencies. So uh, racial profiling is, is, is it, it's not discouraged, it's illegal, it's unethical, it's immoral. And I think it's uh, important for, uh, for the community to hear us say that. I will tell you, with our department, we have a zero tolerance for that. Um, the one thing that we make sure that everyone's treated equitably and everyone's treated fairly. So when we encounter something like that, we want to make sure that the officers know, <coughs> excuse me, officers know that there's zero tolerance. We have zero tolerance for that. We have sexual discrimination, racial discrimination. We have zero tolerance in our agency. Thank you. Any other comments on that one? Okay. All right. Well, we will move on to the, the second portion. And I'll also give you a, kind of a time update. It's, it's about 10 till 7 right now. Um, we're moving into the second part of the, the forum, and there are only two parts. Um, hopefully, depending on how time goes, around 7.15, this is meant to close at 7.30, and around 7.15, if, if that is appropriate at the time in the conversation, uh, we are going to open up the chat box to some questions from our guests um, that perhaps can be answered tonight before we, before we wrap up at 7.30. So we're going to move straight into these next questions for now until that time. Um, we have heard a lot about defunding law enforcement agencies recently. And so thinking about resources and fiscal support, how are the represented agencies here tonight funded? Who would like to start with that? With regard to, in, in phrase a question against it, regard the resources, how are we funded? Yes. Okay. So I'll back up a little bit. So the exact question is, we have heard a lot about defunding law enforcement agencies. How are these represented agencies here tonight funded? We are funded through the city of Statesville's revenue. Um, and that's how we're funded. We don't get a, hardly any outside monies outside of grants that we apply for to supplement some of the things and we can't use that to surplant, which basically means we can't use a grant to buy something that we already have in our budget. So we're funded by the city of Statesville through revenue that's created by the city. So the same thing in Mooresville, we're, we're funded entirely by uh, the budget process here in the town. Um, we are funded as the chief said, through, there are, we have a person that writes grants and tries to find grants for us from time to time that are out there. Uh, we also have some drug forfeiture money that's available to us, but that money cannot be used to replace a line item in our budget. Uh, but so, you know, so basically 95 or more percent of the, of our budget comes directly from the tax base here in Mooresville. Yeah, same thing here in the county. Instead of, uh, uh, conversely, this, the city, it's actually the county, the taxpayer. So uh, uh, the tax base of Iredell County, uh, the 170, 80,000 plus residents and uh, uh, the property taxes, the sales taxes, all that stuff that comes in, uh, that, that funds uh, funds us. And uh, just like uh, Chief Danforchani said, the, the asset forfeiture, the, the drug seizure funds, uh, the sheriff uh, uses those resources uh, in, in ways to benefit the community uh, other than, you know, line items, uh, salaries, personnel, those type things, more, more equipment based, uh, program based. Dr. Brown, I want to turn that one on, on a little bit and just say that for folks who are proposing to defund these agencies, uh, I, I guess I would pose the question, uh, if not, then who? <laughs> uh, 
Um, you know, that, that's the thing I would ask. And, and, and I think as an officer, a lot of times there were situations when we were sent to do things that we ourselves felt like, hey, this is not our place. I mean, I remember going to a, 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 a house one morning because a, a child wouldn't eat fruity pebbles for breakfast. Um, and, and I agree that, you know, that the police and law enforcement are called to be in, in a lot of situations where they really shouldn't be. That, sh that are, if we lived neighborly and loved ourselves as our neighbor, then we would, we would deal with those problems without involving law enforcement in. But let's face facts. I mean, there's three groups of people who will come to your house 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a policeman, a deputy sheriff, a law enforcement officer, an ambulance and a fire truck. And the ambulance and the fire truck aren't coming until we tell them it's safe. Um, so you know, when, when people pose this question about defunding, I guess I just want to say um, it's fine to, to redirect some resources, but if not law enforcement, then who? Uh, because law enforcement has been asked to do a lot of things that aren't, wouldn't have been law enforcement 30 years ago. You, you would have never seen a police officer or a deputy sheriff doing some of the things that we're doing today 30 years ago. I'll get off my soapbox now. That's, that one's a, I'm sensitive on that one. Thank you, Mr. Carver. You actually kind of led us into the next question. Um, which is what would it mean for your agent? What would it mean for your agency if you were defunded or experienced resource reallocations? The one question I always ask when people talk about defunding is what services are the community is the community willing to do without? Because um, you're looking at the core of what police officers do. We respond to 911 calls for service. People are calling because they need help. So usually when we hear this defund the police, you're looking at soft services, which are not the core, not the engine of this vehicle that moves forward. So you're looking at, we do SEPTEDs. We, go out and we talk to businesses after, God forbid, they've had a break-in and tell them what they can do to reduce the opportunities for criminals. We do PALS programs. We do a lot of other things in the community. And you have to ask the community, what are you willing to do without? If you're saying I'm willing to do without PALS, and that's where you're looking at some of the defunding, to actually defund an entire department and say, we're shutting down the police department, we're going to run this ourselves. That's not going to happen. And I think that's not feasible because what you would have to do, and you look at that microcosm that occurred in Seattle when they took over the six blocks, they had to establish the same government that they opposed to run that system. We don't want the police. We don't want anything else. But you had to put a governing party in there to make sure there was stability inside of that. So that was a great example in showing the world. And, it, and I felt sorry for the people who were trapped inside who didn't want to be there, who didn't have a choice. So when you think about defunding is what, are, what services are you willing to lose? Yeah, and to that point, when you're talking about what impact, most of our budgets, um, it's about 88 to 94% personnel costs. So there's not a lot of fat in police budgets. So if you're gonna take money away, you're probably gonna end up cutting positions. Now, as far as um, reallocating resources, you know, the director said it, the chief said it. Um, when I started, uh, the academy was 13 weeks. It's now 26 weeks. But in that extra third, that doubled the academy time. They haven't added another week of constitutional law. They haven't added another week of criminal law. They haven't added another week of search and seizure. They've added dealing with the mentally ill, dealing with the deaf, dealing with the dealing with all these other things that have been put into place because the director alluded to it a little while ago, we're one of the only agencies that you can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and somebody's gonna ask you on the other end of the phone. So because of that, because of our availability to the public, we've been cast in a role that I would be the first to admit that we're not the best to handle. And I think mental health issues is one of them. So um, we're not the best people to equip the mental health and in fact, any mental health practitioner you talk to will tell you the police are probably the worst people to be around some of these people, especially when they're in a crisis. However, we're the ones answering the phone at three o'clock in the morning. We're the ones that have to go to these things. So 
a lot of that, you know, I think has been unfairly placed on the police and has asked us to, to take a role and do a role that we aren't really, if we're being honest, aren't really that equipped to handle. Yeah, in this line of work, you're always asked to do more with less. Uh, so, so defunding is scary, but uh, you know, every every year is a new year. I've uh, been in it 21 years now, seen the ups and downs. Uh, just like Chief Addison said, I can't imagine the programs that would be cut. Uh, the the Sheriff's Athletic League that's went up to like 300 participants in volleyball last year. The the Citizens Academy I was speaking of earlier. One of the things that Sheriff Campbell did, we came in the office was make a teen academy, uh, which is near and dear to me. Getting all those teens involved into that uh, type of stuff. So I I can't imagine chopping those programs. Uh, uh, school resource officers are asked to do more and more things. Uh, you know, at the school level. Um, like social workers, like counselors, uh, you know, we're not trying to replace these positions, but like, like the Chief Capricciani said, we're, we're doing so many, wearing so many different hats, doing so many different roles. And uh, in the county, you know, basically we've got um, uh, about one and a half officers per 1,000 residents. Uh, we cover a big area. So uh, uh, I don't know how we can do that with any less. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's tough. The the cities have a little denser populations and 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 more officers uh, per one thousand. But again, they're running around trying to handle all that, and we're running around trying to handle all this, and we work together well. But um, it's hard when you think about the defunding. I, I can't imagine uh, what what would cut. Uh, definitely, you don't want to cut the reduction in crime stats, uh, which we're real proud of here uh, recently. And 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 I would want to say on that that. Those are the very programs, all the things that, that everybody's talking about, which prevent the problems, which is the reason for this forum. You know, all those relationships, all those opportunities to build relationships with officers and the community are the very thing we don't want to do. Uh, you know, if, if we're talking about making our community a safer and better place to live. Uh, we, we don't want to cut any of those programs or stretch the officers any thinner than they already are. Uh, let's face it, we're, we're fortunate to live in the community we do uh, and, and have the agencies that work together. Uh, I, I would hate to see us follow the way of some, some other folks that aren't doing it right because I think we're doing a lot of the things in Iredale County in our cities and towns and at the sheriff's office that are right, that other people ought to want to be doing the way we are. Thank you all for your comments on that. Um, moving, turning the tables a little bit here. The next question is, what do officers need more of to help them effectively serve our community? kind of overlaps this last conversation. But what do you need more of to help you better serve the community? They're not gonna jump in, so I'm gonna jump in on that one. Uh, I think what they want more than anything else is just is just the support, is just the, the uh, and I'm not talking about financial support. I'm not talking about, um, I'm talking about just, just giving them the benefit of the doubt, seeing them as people. See your law enforcement officers as part of your community. And, and I think that's probably what they want more than anything else is, is to, you know, don't judge me until you, until you know all the facts, right? And I think that sometimes today we're, we're judging people without even knowing what took place yet and, and give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, and if they're wrong, they're wrong. You know, if an officer's wrong, he's wrong and he should be punished. But if he's not wrong, don't punish him just because he's an officer. I think there is an obligation as leaders of our agencies, um, to make sure that these officers understand. There's a huge exodus from law enforcement right now. There's a lot of people retiring, 
there's a lot of people getting out of this. They want to find something else to do. And one of the questions I always have, and I've talked to several people across the state who want to get out of being a law enforcement officer. And I said, well, what got you into it? What was the reason why you wanted to become a law enforcement officer? The reason why I adorn this badge is because I believe the good guys go home and the bad guys go to jail and I can't stand a bully. Could never stand a bully. So when someone does something wrong, and this is something to think about, someone does something wrong, which tarnishes the badge that we wear, we get rid of them. They can never wear this badge again, but we will always pay the penance for their wrongs. They will, the Statesville Police Department, not that one individual who else operated outside of the scope of the training, who didn't do any of the things that we taught him or her to do, it's Statesville Police Department. So we have to keep making deposits in that account so that that day when we have to make a withdrawal, we have sufficient balance in there that will be all right. My heart goes out to these younger officers who have to go through this because you are now, you know, and a lot of the community has been very supportive of us, but you've got a lot <clears throat> that go out there and deal with, oh, you're a sellout, you're on time, you're just doing this, and blah, blah, blah. You know, you tell people, we're not like the fire department. They don't give us calendars. So we get up every morning with the sole purpose of we've got to make this day better than it was yesterday. Because people don't call us again when they're having a great day. They call us when things are really going bad. So I always tell people, people don't remember what you do for them as much as how much you make them feel. How you make someone feel. When we have to make an arrest, we may arrest 100 people. They will always remember who you are. But you can't remember all the people that you've arrested. So that's why. Your attitude, your professionalism matters. But what the officers need today, and I would just echo what uh, Todd said, is we need support. Um, financially, <coughs> excuse me, we are, we're getting our needs met. We're getting some of the basic stuff that we require. But the officers need to know that they're out here and they're doing this job for all the right reasons. Because they didn't sign up to get rich. They didn't sign up to make a lot of friends. They signed up to make this community a better one. Thank you. Yeah, all those things. I mean, that's uh, what do you what do you say to these young officers? Um, uh, like Chief Addison said, why did you why did you get into this? I've I've reminded a couple of the guys that I work with the same thing. Uh, I can remember when the uh, planes crashed into the to the buildings. Nine eleven oh one. I was I was on the job then, and and it was uh, um, that that was that was a tough time. Uh, we had we had some appreciation in law enforcement. We've seen the ups and downs. Uh, this is a down. This is an all time low. Um, I'm, I've 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 getting the thank yous a couple times from people, and and it's great. Um, but you know, it's customer service. One of the things Sheriff Campbell talks about customer service. So you've got to keep your head up, keep smiling, keep going on. Just uh, in, in this. Uh, uh, COVID stuff going on, the other people that's out there still working at those essential jobs, um, you know, we're doing what we have to do. And, uh, and you know, don't judge us based on uh, a, a nation, okay? So, um, like Todd said, we're, we're fortunate here in Idaho County uh, in, in the, the residents that we have, but uh, don't, don't take one officer out in another state uh, making a big mistake and uh, and you know place place the blame here at our feet. Uh, we're still moving forward. We're still doing all we can do. So uh, we appreciate that support. Any other comments on that one? Okay. We have uh, one final question, but it's so similar to that one. I think I would actually rather go ahead and go to the chat. Um, so um, Melissa Hill is kindly assisting us tonight with that. So I think if we can get that set up, she's going to work on opening the chat feature to where if there are questions, you can use your chat box to type any questions that you may have that we've not covered tonight and then we can share those with the panelists and see who has uh, thoughts related to those. So I'll give everybody a, a moment to make sure that chat box is working.
Okay. Mine does appear to be working. Are there any participants that have, there we go, good. Okay, so Anastasia has a question here. In light of the national climate towards law enforcement, what do you do to encourage more good people to become a law enforcement officer? Who would like to take that one? I'll jump, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Chief Addison. <laughs> I was going to say, be the example. Be the change that you want to see for yourself. So be that change. So for me, even with the younger officers, I make it a point that we speak, that we communicate, that we have that open dialogue. Sometimes you have to have those hard conversations and that draws people to you because people often want to come to a place that they're going to enjoy working. And sometimes money's using, sometimes money's a motivation, but not all the time. They enjoy where they work. They want to come work with you. So we try to inspire people to choose this profession because it is still a very noble profession. Thank you. Yeah, and I want to say uh, Anastasia is actually getting ready to be one of our students in our uh, upcoming BLET. Uh, she'll be starting uh, August the 17th. So uh, she's a perfect example of, of somebody that, that I've had the opportunity to work with through an internship through the college when I was at the sheriff's office, and now we're encouraging her to go to BLET. So, and that's building relationships with people. And that's not something you can do in a, in a day. It's not something you can do in an hour and a half Zoom meeting. It takes time to build that relationship. And that's why those programs we were talking about a little while ago, like that POW League, the Teen Academy, the, all these things that these agencies are doing are so important because you're planting seeds. Matt knows, Matt sees kids come up to him in Walmart that he taught a day or two 10 years ago that now have children, you know, you know, maybe a little bit older than that. So maybe I got the time frame off on that, but y'all get what I'm saying. Uh, and as mad as you get older than me, you, you start to see two generations of them. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's 15 years and they've introduced their kids to me. You're right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the kind of thing you do to, to bring about change in our profession, you know, and that's just, and that is a slow return on investment but you got to keep doing it. you got to keep doing it. I think for all of us, we, and we do it, Chief mentioned it, it starts from the top down. Uh, but I think for us and everybody here, our best ambassadors are the officers that we have out on the street. Um, they're the ones that are going to answer that question. What do you do? to encourage more people. They do it every day. These men and women do every day out there um, and they talk about what it's like and they talk about what the department's like and how it's, it's good, it's a good place to work. And like I said, they're our best ambassadors in this and the public sees them and we, we can only hope that that, that that type of interaction uh, rubs off on the community. Any other comments on that question? Okay, I'm gonna move on to this next one here. Uh, Dr. Brannon from Mitchell has said, what types of ongoing training is required for officers once they are on the job? They are required to do in-service every year and we get to pick some of the topics and some of that's mandated by the state but they have to have a firearms requirement. They have to have a legal update. And so there's certain coursework that they have to take throughout the years, like a continual legal education coursework, but it's done for just for police officers. That allows them to get anything new topics, anything that's hot pressing button that they need to deal with. So they get that education throughout the year, plus anything that we deem necessary as we move forward. Yeah, the, the, the uh, in-service training is, I believe it's 40 hours of in-service training uh, each year by the time you add all the uh, stuff together and there are, the topics change from year to year. Um, uh, just a really wide range of, of topics that get covered over the course of, you know, five or six years. Um, some of that's developed through the, maybe the Justice Academy. Uh, some of that's training that we offer here at Mitchell Community College. Uh, lots of different types of stuff that, 
that you have to keep up in order to maintain your certification as an officer. Two other things I'll bring up uh, uh, as long, along with that is bloodborne pathogens and uh, hazardous materials training. Uh, we constantly stay updated on those. Um, you know, safety, 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 officer safety is a big thing. Uh, I, I know that uh, use of force, which is what we talked about earlier in one of the questions, uh, you know, I was talking about the stair step, the continuum. Uh, use of force is taught every year through several different courses. Uh, the pepper spray course, use of force, the uh, uh, baton training, the impact weapon, use of force. Uh, with our firearm, before we ever take the, the field, so to speak, to uh, take go to the range, uh, we do a classroom portion and are tested uh, on our firearms classroom, which is use of force. Uh, so we, we get that, uh, you know, when, when to use force, when not to use force. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna move on to another one that was sent. And um, this guest would like to know what uh, Chief Campuchiano finds so intriguing about the Morsel and Iredell County area. I was trying to read the chat here, but can you give me that again? Yes, it was sent to me, it was sent to me privately Think it's anonymous but the question is um, the the guest is curious about what Chief Camper, Camperciano finds so intriguing about the Mooresville and Iredell County area. Okay well let me tell you what I find not so intriguing and that is it's way too hot down here for me. <laughs> so let's start with that one um, and I've said this before when I came down here last June just as a point of reference we had four inches of snow on Mother's Day. So as far as what, uh, it's really a unique place down here, Mooresville and Iredell County uh, for a couple of reasons. One is this community supports this police department like nothing I've ever seen before. Uh, and the town board supports this police department uh, and it's so, different from the area I, I came from and I spent my life in. Um, and just like for distance, we talked about money and what this town has put into it. Um, and just to give you an idea of a compare and contrast, uh, where I came from, I used to have to submit four budgets every year. I had to submit a 10% cut, a 5% cut, a level funded budget, which was cuts, and then a level funded with contractual raises. raises. So. Um, needless to say, we were, you know, putting a lot of duct tape on things and trying to make cars last and do a lot of things. And it's very hard to police like that. Um, you don't find that here. Um, and the people seem to be just, um, there is a broader sense down here. And I don't want to be disingenuous to the North, but um, there's a greater, I think, sense of people down here about right and wrong um and they just uh, people down here if for the most part they listen if they've done something wrong they know they've done something wrong and they take it i when i first came here i remember getting emails um from people thanking me that i got a ticket i deserved it but i wanted to thank the officer for his professionalism i thought i was being punked i was looking for the cameras because I'd never seen anything like that uh, before. So um, it's really a special place down here for me um, for the, that and a whole bunch of reasons. So much so like I, I wasn't, I was here for six months. I had a contract for six months to do certain things down here and I was going home. Um, I have teenage daughters and uh, we have a life up in Massachusetts, but um, this place kind of grabs hold of you down here. Uh, and it's been a while without my family. They'll finally be here next week. Uh, and we're all in down here. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, and for me, it's a great place to raise my daughters. And it's just really, really, I think when you, like I, I said at the beginning of this, um, I think I come with a different set of eyes because I'm looking at it from a 
different perspective and it really truly is a really special place down here. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question and this is from Dr. Sylvia Burgess and it looks like it's a two-part question. So let's go with the first part. How do you respond to your officers about the fact that black males are the highest statistic related to police force throughout the country and avoiding that as a statistic in your region? Do you mean to read it again? Can you see that question? If you could read it again, I apologize. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's, 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 it's a little long. Um, how do you respond to your officers about the fact that black males are the highest statistic related to police force throughout the, con throughout the country and avoiding that as, as a statistic in our region? It goes back to having those hard conversations with personnel. Understanding the reason why people are making the vehicle stops and why they're stopping people, making sure that they're valid reasons. And if they're not valid reasons, we have that next step is, okay, how do we fix this? What is a remedy for that? But we try to make sure that if, if that does happen, and we're seeing a disproportionate, we want to know why. Because if this officer is assigned to a certain community for which he or she is predominantly black or predominantly white, then there's going to be a disproportionate amount of people of a particular race that they're going to encounter. But we want to make sure that everything's being done fairly. And as long as it's being done fairly, then we're good. If it's not being done fairly, then we look at the practices and see if there's something that we need to really zone in on or something that we need to change. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so I'll go to the second part of that question. How do you respond to the belief by citizens that the training to become a police to become a police officer is much less than most professions, and is it enough? I'll I'll, I'll uh, chime in on that one. Uh, I think there are are some things that uh, we as police officers would like to have more training on, um, but like the chief said, uh, Chief Campichani said, it's it's almost doubled. And in, just in my career, uh, I think when I came to BLET, it was like uh, 400 hours, and now it's up to 640 hours. I, I'll say that the the bulk of the train, the best training, I mean, I'm not trying to shoot my own self in the foot here, but the most realistic training that officers get is after they get out of BLET. It's when you're learning and doing that field training. Um, and I think departments are investing a lot more time in that field training in 2020 than they were even in 2010, and certainly more than they were in the 90s. Um, so I, I think we, we've improved training. Training is something that's it's only as good as uh, today. You've got to keep, you got to keep going. It's, it's like a, it's like a marriage. You can't, you can't, you got to keep that nurtured, right? You can't just, uh, set it on a shelf and forget about it. You got to keep working at it. And, um, and I think that's what we're trying to do as a profession, um, but we can always do better. I'll just say I'm a big proponent of uh, education and training. Um, yeah, spending a lot of time at the college level. Uh, you, you just can't get the same stuff that you can hands on. And, uh, you know, you can, you can be told, I know Todd said earlier about, hey, come on down and try out the uh, simulator. Well, that's one of the things that the Sheriff's Office has done, uh, the Teen Academy, the Citizens Academy, and, and there's also a, a Senior uh, Academy. But one of the things that we do is, is put them in situations, uh, put, the, uh, put the swap vest on them, uh, put them, you know, put them through some of the training, uh, just so citizens could see that, um, you know, this job's not easy uh, because of all the external forces, uh, but particularly the uh, the the, the hands-on training is is tough. Uh, you know, fighting that red man. Anybody that's done that knows how hard that is. You put that padded suit on. Uh, excuse me, the bad guy. Uh, our our training uh, coordinator puts that padded suit on, and it happens to be red, and uh, he doesn't feel a thing. But you feel every time he pops you in the noggin 
uh, and that's part of the uh, use of force training that we go through. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've started here lately is a force on force training. And uh, that's where they use these uh, uh, simulated bullets, little, little paintballs inside of a bullet. It makes a pop and it makes a blister when it hits you. But, uh, but you remember, uh, you know, on that vehicle stop that you, uh, that the instructor set up and uh, when you miss that weapon that was pointed at you, you feel it. And, uh, you know, if we can do these things to, to keep officers alive and, uh, you know, keep citizens alive as well, you know, to all the way around, um, you know, lots of use of force training that we do. And there's never enough. Uh, there's never enough. Uh, uh, we're not perfect. Uh, and until everyone is, I guess, then there'll be no more need for training. But, uh, but I'm a big lover of it. Just bring it on. All of us could use more. The one thing about law enforcement is you can never tell when someone's biases are going to rise to the top and show out. There's no test that we can give a law enforcement officer in the very beginning and say, are you going to treat people differently? You instill in them what you expect from them, and you hope they'll carry that out. When that doesn't happen, it's our responsibility as leaders of these organizations to make sure that we weed those people out because they tarnish the badge that we wear and it creates a distrust in our community. So that responsibility, responsibility excuse me, falls on our shoulders. I want to follow that up by saying that nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop. And I think all, all of us will agree with that because the officers who are out there doing it right, uh, somebody comes along and cuts a corner, cheats in some way, uh, is treating people wrong, they make it harder for everybody else. For everybody who's trying to do it right, uh, you know, that knucklehead uh, makes it hard on everybody else. Thank you all. And we have another question here. What is a police or community interaction that is recent that you are particularly proud of? A police interaction, a community interaction that you are recently very proud of? I would start off with the protests. Every city across America, for the most part, has had some form of protests or unrest. Part of what we did and even with the sheriff and the county, we got together and we got in front of this. So the damage and the mayhem that you saw that occurred in other communities didn't happen here. We sat down with the protesters and said, okay, what are you attempting to accomplish? What do you expect to get out of the protest? And we met them where they wanted, because a lot of times they said the voices of the unheard is usually resulted in violence and rioting. But when you listen to people, you don't always have to agree. But when you listen to people and they know that their voice is being heard, that matters so much. So that for us, as much as it was a stressful situation, because I was worried about the citizens, I was worried about the officers, and I was worried about our city. It was a stressful situation, but it went very well. Every protest after that went very well because we met with the protesters. And I wanted them to understand that you have a voice. All that we ask is that you be respectful with that voice. Uh, in that same vein, we had two protests here in Mooresville. Both of them were very peaceful. Um, and one of the, a couple of the organizers of one of the protests, we have now uh, met with them the last month or so, and we formed a committee here with myself, one of the commissioners, the mayor, the town manager, uh, the people that organized that protest. Uh, and, and we're going to uh, start a task force here in Mooresville and we're, we're constantly communicating on what we want to do to bring the community together. Uh, we have a number of ideas. It's, this committee is in its infancy, but we are committed to making it better here. And we've all agreed um, that we have uh, some bridges to repair, but not as nearly as bad as they are in other places in the country. And so we're fortunate in that. And we all agree, as the chief just said, it's the same thing. We've all agreed to um, listen to each other and listen to each other's viewpoints. Uh, 
so that it doesn't become the, lar the, loudest, the loudest voice in the room is the one that takes over these meetings. That's not the case. It's been very, it's been a very positive meeting and it's interesting. I've, as, you, as I've gone into these meetings, there's always a little apprehensiveness when you first go into these, at least on my part, because you don't know what to expect. And every, every, after every one of these meetings, I've walked out feeling so much better. Uh, it's really amazing. And, and they've been very productive. And uh, I, really, I really can't wait to see what we're going to do here as we roll some of this stuff out. It's been, it's, it's, I think it's going to be a pretty cool thing to see here uh, in Morrisville. The last thing I was just going to say was, uh, I know thinking about children, um, it starts at home and it starts with our young people and it starts in how they're, uh, uh, how we educate them, teach them, train them, mentor them, bring them up. Uh, and, and, and I know we've got a lot of community partners out there that's, uh, uh, that, that, you know, are trying to let us know that they appreciate the job we're doing. Uh, bringing you know goodies and things and food and stuff down to the uh, to the agency for for, uh, for the officers and making crafts and stuff. Well, we're just going to try to give that back and uh, invest in our in our youth. Uh, I can't give away a whole lot, but I know the sheriff's got a program that uh, uh, we're looking at trying to single out some of the good behavior. I know someone asked in one of the chats, you know, how do you pick out those good officers? Encourage them to be good. Well, let's encourage those kids to keep being good. You know, when we find, uh, um, you know, if we can catch a kid doing something good, whether it be in the community or in the schools or somewhere else, and reinforce that behavior, um, you know, with us. So it's it's kind of like um, uh, instead of law enforcement, it's good reinforcement. Uh, one of those things that we're trying to trying to do at the sheriff's office. So, uh, um, yep, stay tuned. Good things to come, hopefully. And I'll real quickly just uh, you said when was the most last most recent time that we'd had a positive experience like that. I had a young student come in to see me yesterday uh, who's interested in going to BLET. He's going to start in the spring of uh, next year and he was part of our law enforcement explorers group. Uh, when I was working at the sheriff's office there's a seed that was planted 10 years ago and now it's, it's coming back. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I think if we are able to keep doing some of the things that we're doing right, uh, then we got a we got a, a bright future. So maybe I'm a glasses half full kind of person though. Thank you. Any other responses to that? I think that's a wonderful place to wrap up. Um, and, and it's just right, almost 7.30. So that was perfect timing. I do want to share that this has been recorded. And so if you know of someone that wanted to come to this tonight and was unable, um, please get them to get in touch with uh, Dr. Brewer or myself or Mr. Carver, anybody that is connected here with Mitchell, and we'll be happy to um, share how that is going to be. Uh, it's I'm assuming it's going to be on our website, but we can provide some more information about that later. Um, again, I just want to say thank you so much to our panelists. I know you all are so busy and we appreciate you working this into your into your business lives and to your into your personal lives in this evening time. We appreciate it so much. Thank you to our guests who were able to attend. Thank you for these great questions that you all shared. And um, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Brewer for any final comments. I would simply say the same things as, as Beverly has had. This has been a, a fantastic conversation and panel and forum. It's been very informative for me, and I hope that's the case for all of those that have attended. To you, uh, to our panelists, thank you so much for your time. I know each of you are extremely busy, and I hope that the college can, can continue to serve as an avenue to have these conversations. Uh, regardless of what the topic is. We're grateful for your service and thank you all. Have, have a wonderful evening.